The foreign journalists who really have come to expect leadership from the United States and for us to set uh, a standard that many of them cannot, unfortunately, not attain uh, for them to come here and be confronted with rules and, and laws like that is probably, uh, well, it's undoubtedly going to shock them. My name is Don Wycliffe. I'm a faculty member here at uh, the Loyola School of Communication and the moderator for this afternoon's panel, which is a co-production of the Loyola School of Communication, the Headliners Club of Chicago, and the McCormick Foundation. And I'm grateful to all of them for putting together a panel of this magnitude on a, on a topic of this importance. Um, Loyola decided to uh, create this discussion because the issue involved the reach or perhaps the overreach of the Illinois eavesdropping law goes to the heart of what journalists do, which is gather information about matters of public significance and transmit it in print, through video or audio, to the general public so members of the public can perform their duties as citizens. The portion of the Illinois Eavesdropping Act that is of concern to us today is, if not unique in the nation, then at least highly unusual. It forbids anyone to make an audio recording of conversations in a public place without the consent of all those involved in the con conversation. And most controversially, it forbids such recording of police officers or presumably other officials um, under pain of a potential 15-year prison sentence. Um, so, you're in Daly Plaza on a lovely spring day and you see a police officer confront someone for an offense against the public peace and order. You whip out your cell phone, smartphone, equipped with video and audio capability. I'll bet you almost everybody here has one and has done something like this at one time or another. Standing a respectful distance away, you press the button and begin recording. You're legally free to videotape the incident. You're free to take still photographs. You're free to make copious notes and using your high school shorthand to take it all down verbatim and then to publish it. But you can't record the audio under pain of prison. Why? I'm hoping our uh, guests this afternoon will be able to enlighten us on that. I want to introduce them to you. On my immediate right is Superintendent Gary McCarthy of the Chicago Police Department. Uh, Superintendent McCarthy came to Chicago last summer from Newark, where he was police director. Before that, he was for many years a member of the New York City Police Department and um, uh, the son of a police detective in New York. He rose to the highest ranks in the department and operated, uh, was in charge of their CompStat program, which uses uh, statistical analysis of crime to uh, suppress crime. And he enjoyed enormous success as when he was chief in Newark. And Mayor Rahm Emanuel recruited him here for uh, the toughest job in the city, Mayor Emanuel's being the second toughest. <laughs> Next to him is Lucy Dalglish, Executive Director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, possibly the foremost defender of press freedom in the nation. Ms. Dalglish worked for 13 years as a reporter for the St. Paul Pioneer Press and was a trial lawyer at a Minneapolis law firm for several years before joining the Reporters Committee in 2000. And to her right is Harvey Grossman, legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois, which has mounted one of several challenges in the courts to the controversial section of the Illinois Eavesdropping Act. Mr. Grossman is a graduate of Northwestern University School of Law and before joining the Illinois ACLU, 
worked as an attorney for a downstate legal assistance foundation. I've asked each of the panelists to take five minutes at the start to lay out his or her thoughts on the issues involved in this controversy. After all of them have spoken, I'll put some questions to them. And then, after not too long a time, I hope we'll open things up to questions from the floor. I encourage everyone to take advantage of the opportunity, especially the students, and especially my students in my historical and critical issues course. So, Superintendent McCarthy, why don't you start us off and uh, have a go. I, I knew you were going to ask me to speak first. Um, and, and I got to tell you, it's going to be hard for me to fill five minutes because, you know, it's, it's pretty much black and white, uh, cut and dry. Um, I got, first of all, my experience in New York State and New Jersey are completely different. So this is a foreign concept to me, and I actually only became aware of this when um, we came and, and started dealing with Occupy Chicago back uh, a few months ago. Because in New York and in New Jersey, we would videotape goings on uh, at rallies like this for the protection of the police and for the protection of the people who were being arrested. And that's when it came to my attention the uh, first night after we made, uh, I believe it was 147 arrests. Um, the goal was to ensure that what was recorded was the fact that, excuse me, sir, you're in violation of the law. <laughs> You're about to be arrested. You have the opportunity to leave. If you choose to leave, you can go now. If you choose to stay, you will be arrested, which was the warning that we gave every single 147 people who were arrested that night. And the next day, I was like, so let me see the videotape. And that's what I saw was videotape. And all I saw was this. And I said, well, this is problematic because the idea is to show exactly what we were doing, giving people warnings, and, and it was uh, an enlightening moment for me, and that's when this came to my attention. So within those constraints, we have to come up with our policies in the department of what we can and cannot take without somebody else's um, permission. So that was the first thing. The second thing was recently, and I was unaware about the issue of not being able to videotape a police officer until such time as there was a case that was overturned very publicly here in Chicago. And um, as a result of that, I kind of think that it appears that this whole issue is, is going out the window. Um, I'm not accustomed to it. It wasn't in New York and it was not in New Jersey. Uh, you know, it, it seems to follow that um, if Illinois, as you say, is the only state in the union that has such a law, um, I, I don't see how it's going to stand up over the long term. Um, as far as the use of video and videotape, uh, I certainly endorse it for the protection of the police as well as people who are being arrested. There's no argument when you can show a videotape and you can look at what happened. Um, in many cases, uh, you, you see, and anybody who watches those cop shows, which quite frankly I don't, but um, you'll see videotape of car stops and you see exactly what happens. There's no refuting what's going on. So I actually am a, a person who endorses video and audio recording is the only thing that I can say about this. And, and the law is the law. And I don't want to get, I, I would be in trouble if I got caught up in a policy issue as far as what we're doing within the department um, to address these things. But it seems to me that uh, it's there for the protection of everybody. So I endorse it. Establish. Thanks, Don. It's very nice to be invited to Chicago. I always enjoy coming here and seeing some old friends. <laughs> Good. Uh, I have to say, uh, when I heard about this case, uh, we have a, a, we've been at doing secret courts and prior restraints work for more than 40 years. And I have one legal fellow who does nothing but this particular subject area. We consider arrests and blocking of journalistic activity to be a, a prior restraint on publication of news. And when they told me about this and said that the ACLU in um, Chicago was very involved in a brief and there were a couple of cases, and I said, well, what's the problem? What is this eavesdropping law? And they explained it to me and I went, huh? Are you kidding me? 
Uh, it, it is unique in the nation. Uh, I think it's probably an outgrowth. It is not unusual. There are about a dozen states out there that have more generic eavesdropping laws. In other words, that both parties to a telephone conversation have to know that a recording is occurring. That is not an uncommon, an uncommon standard for telephone recording. Um, there are only about a dozen states that do it that way. But this whole thing, banning the recording of something that happens in public is nonsense. Uh, I can't even imagine uh, where this came from. I will tell you, I, I think I'm probably expected to provide a little bit of national perspective here, so I think that's what I will focus on. Um, in the last year, we have seen an incredible increase in the number of cases nationwide where journalists have been arrested for basically engaging in news gathering behavior. Most of the time the journalists are covering protests, whether it's Occupy Wall Street or um, the G8 uh, or anything like that. Um, World, in Washington it's usually the World Bank protests. We have always had occasional problems, but lately I don't know what's in the water. I don't know what's going on in the police business. I don't know if it's because every third 25-year-old on the street has an iPhone that can record everything a cop does. I don't know what's going on, but we are working on this all the time. It's really crazy. And um, it, some of them, when, when reporters are actually arrested and charges are brought for news gathering activity, many of them actually sue. And you know, I can't think of a single one where there has not been a settlement where uh, either the activity was, the, the, the police department was reprimanded or somebody got a really big settlement from the city coffers. Uh, but in addition to covering the protest activity, we've seen some really wacky examples recently. Uh, you're, you guys are relatively close to Milwaukee. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a overnight reporter, photographer, who had been working on the street covering overnight cops and fire, fire department activity for 45 years. He knew virtually every cop, every firefighter in town. There was activity going on across the street. He did, uh, there was a fire. He stood on a public sidewalk along with all the neighbors and started recording this and a police officer came across the street and said, what are you doing, what are you doing, get out of here, stop, turn off that camera and everything. Left all the neighbors alone, but was targeted because he was engaging in news gathering behavior. We're seeing more and more of this around the country. And I uh, just today, in fact, finally solidified our plans uh, since 1972 as a result of the 68 Chicago Democratic National Convention since 1972, the Reporters Committee has had a hotline at the political conventions. The hotline is a way for journalists who have been arrested while covering the conventions to hopefully be processed quickly through the arrest and detention um, uh, mechanism so that we can get them out very quickly. We have lawyers standing by to spring them as quickly as they can so they can be back out on the street covering news. Uh, and yesterday we, saw, we made the arrangements with our Tampa and Charlotte um, uh, attorneys. They're all volunteers and it is, as you might imagine, the, um, the activity is always the greatest at the Republican National Convention. Um, but reporters will always get swept up in this activity, um, but uh, I can also point out my, my last um, point will be uh, in 2008 in St. Paul, a reporter by the name of Amy Goodman, who worked for an organization called Democracy Now!, she and two members of her crew were arrested on the first day of the convention. Now, Amy, if those of you who've heard her radio show, she can be a little confrontational. So instead of being, uh, you know, meekly saying, okay, yeah, you can arrest me, she kind of got in their face. But she felt very strongly that that was an illegal arrest, and as a result, 
um, she and her crew came to a $100,000 settlement with the police of Minneapolis and St. Paul. They were kind of a joint um, police um, uh, arrangement during the, the conventions. But part of the settlement was every policeman in St. Paul has to go through a course, an online course, on what the law says you can do and what the law says you cannot do during protest activities, both regarding what citizens are, 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 are their protest activity as well as news gathering. And we are helping the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. We, we drafted our portion of that curriculum. Now, of course, it's going to go to the police department and they will have to make it you know, conform to their standards. But uh, it was actually a fairly easy thing to write because the law is so danged clear. Uh, I think I'll just sit back and hear more about this case that you guys have been involved in and been doing such a wonderful job with. <clears throat> well, thanks for the opportunity to come and speak to you. This is the perfect crowd uh, to uh, address these issues to because you are interested in communication, you are interested in informing people on matters of public concern, and this is an incredible restraint on that function. It is a restraint on that function not only for the organized media, but in fact, in the day of the citizen journalists, which I think we're living through, Don described this as everybody having a smartphone, uh, we are all journalists, we are all communicators, we are all people who are interested in gathering information and in recording that information and disseminating that information. Um, about six years ago, the cases started coming into our office uh, and we were amazed. Uh, we had dealt with uh, many issues involving ad hoc restraints on speech for both journalists and for citizens who were being arrested all over the state. Uh, in fact, uh, for us, the seminal case is a case that goes back to the Chicago Convention when we represented uh, a photographer named Schnell uh, and did an emergency case up to the Federal Court of Appeals because the Chicago Police Department at that time were preventing photographers, press photographers, from taking pictures of what was going on out on the streets and also were covering their badges or removing their badges and there was a temporary restraining order that was entered uh, in this very important case that authorized the press uh, and recognized its First Amendment privileges to uh, take photographs of police on the streets. And we rely on that case today uh, in the case that we subsequently brought. Uh, but about six years ago, we started getting complaints from all over the state, from small counties and large counties. Uh, the people were being arrested for uh, recording the uh, uh, goings-on of their interactions with police officers. They were primarily people who were being subjected to arrest themselves, uh, but in several instances they weren't. There was a cop watch program in Champaign County uh, in which members of the minority community were concerned about the quality of law enforcement that was being provided in their community. Uh, they actually had a visible large camera uh, out on the streets and they were trying to film interactions. They were arrested and prosecuted for violation of this ordinance. Uh, we started off by writing up little friends of the court briefs and sending them out to public defenders all over the state of Illinois thinking that it was aberrational, that how could a state's attorney, how could a police department with a straight face prosecute law-abiding citizens for doing nothing more than overtly, openly recording an event. Uh, but in fact, the prosecutions continue to come. Uh, we had, of course, as the ACLU, been monitoring police and, demonstration, and demonstrators both uh, for decades. Uh, we've been legal observers in uh, almost every major march and demonstration you can think of that's occurred in Chicago for the last 25 years. And so for us, we started thinking for the first time, we had been using uh, a still camera uh, but we had never really thought about uh, what the uh, restraints were on us in fully developing our program. Well, about the same time, we were going online ourselves, and our website was expanding, and we were using video, and we were YouTubing our stuff, uh, and as our media relations department became more and more sophisticated, we re realized that it was a direct restraint on us as well. Uh, just about that time, Anita Alvarez, who is the state's attorney uh, here in Chicago, filed her third case against a citizen for recording police officers uh, doing their public duties on the streets. Uh, and we decided that it was time to stop sending amicus briefs around the states and picking off little cases and try to get the issue resolved once and for all for everybody. 
uh, journalists uh, and uh, citizen journalists. Uh, and so we filed suit in district court on behalf of ourselves, and we explained that we wanted to have a program, we wanted to expand the program that we used of legal observers on, on the streets. We wanted to expand that program to allow us to audio record, in fact, interactions with police officers, and we were very specific about it. That is that we would openly record, we weren't going to try to do any surreptitious recording, that we were going to focus on police officers and civilian interactions, that it was only going to be when police officers were in the performance of their public duties, that it was only when they occur, uh, occurred in public places, and that we were recording with devices that were not super sensitive, that in fact we were only recording conversations that were audible to a passerby, that were audible to the unassisted human ear. Uh, and finally, that we would commit no other violations of the law, for example, obstructing a police officer. Um, we were shocked when the federal district court here gave us kind of a short hearing on this case and in a kind of summary and confused process that didn't have much to do with really deciding the case, she did say that, uh, Judge Conlon did say that the uh, First Amendment didn't provide such a right. Uh, and so we are in the Court of Appeals in the Seventh Circuit and we are arguing that in fact uh, this is a violation of the right to receive information to gather information as a news, as, as a news reporter would, uh, to record that information, to disseminate that information. And we have uh, two other uh, um, uh, provisos and, and supporting structures under the First Amendment that we argue. And that is that uh, for us, this is incident to the right to petition for redress of grievances. Because what we do through our work and why it is that we're interested in that is that we seek either reform of behavior on the part of the police officers that needs to be reformed, or we, in some instances, file lawsuits and seek judicial review of that behavior. So we throw out not only the First Amendment as support for the proposition, but also the right to petition for redress of grievances. And you as journalists really do that every day, uh, or you will do that every day. Um, and uh, so uh, that became, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the the controversy that's been framed uh, for the courts. At the same time that we're proceeding with our case, uh, there is a case that has gone up to the Illinois Supreme Court. And so this issue is being briefed right now in a case called People versus Allison. It does not present the same issues in the sense of uh, it is not open recording, uh, it didn't, does not take place solely in public places, uh, and it has a complicated set of facts, but it, it is a challenge in part uh, to the right to uh, record police officers. Uh, I commend Superintendent uh, McCarthy here today. This is a breath of fresh air. Uh, that's an understatement. Uh, and so I commend him for his position on this. Uh, and it is important. I'm definitely in trouble now. <laughs> because You've got the, the ACLU endorsing me. <laughs> no, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't do that. I endorsed your position. Uh, and so, um, and, and so, uh, there is a general order in the police department, or there has been a general order in the police department that recognizes that when police uh, are doing the recording, uh, incident to an exception in the statute, the statute does allow police to do recording when they're making an enforcement stop and they're using a vehicle that's equipped with a video recorder, that in fact there is no expectation of privacy on the part of police officers when they do that. They can't sue the police department because the police department gives them as their duty uh, uh, requires them as an obligation of their duty to videotape and audio tape, and they also, if that tape is subsequently used, uh, the department is immune from liability because of that proviso as well. Um, somebody asked the question, how did this happen? Yeah. Well, strangely enough, it happened uh, because a person in the back of a patrol car openly recorded the conversation between two police officers in 1985. And in 1986, the Illinois Supreme Court said that that didn't violate the then existing statute as it was written. Uh, because the police officers basically were not engaged in a, quote, private conversation. They knew the person was in the back. He was openly recording the conversation. And so no law was violated. The response of our legislature in 1994 was to amend the statute and to say that it didn't matter if the person had an expectation of privacy or not that it was straight two-party consent. If people didn't consent, you couldn't record them. It was an absolute rule. 
Uh, and then about five years later, they enhanced the penalties for recording police officers. If you record a police officer or a judge, it's a class one felony subject to up to 15 years in, in uh, prison. If you, uh, if you don't, it's a misdemeanor uh, with one year, uh, one to three years. Uh, so as a consequence, um, there is specialized protection for police officers uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, how does that play out? Well, you know, I think the first time that we saw uh, in modern times uh, a, uh, a uh, use of the citizen journalist in the context of police misconduct was the Rodney King case, and that tape vibrated uh, and went viral across the country. Uh, but really, it, we can go back to Selma, because Bloody Sunday, what we know about, uh, about the treatment of uh, protesters uh, trying to cross the Raymond Pettus Bridge uh, uh, in Selma, in the midst of the civil rights struggle, we get from journalists having recorded those incidents. Um, and uh, those uh, are some of the most powerful uh, visual recordings in terms of social change and social progress in America. So um, that's how we see the impediment. Uh, there is a bill that has been introduced uh, in Illinois uh, this legislative session uh, uh, by uh, uh, Senator Neckritz, uh, which does seek uh, to do uh, much of what we're trying to do in our lawsuit. Uh, and uh, I hope that law passes, uh, those amendments pass. On the other hand, I think that it's proper for the courts to do repair and redress here too. Um, they were not particularly tolerant of the restraints uh, on speech in 1986 in the Beardsley decision, uh, and it would be good for the court to set its own jurisprudence straight. Um, so those Great. are my opening comments. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent McCarthy, when confronted with, with a, a, a law of this sort, which I'll be very frank, uh, on its face seems absurd to me, but I, I can't just dismiss it. I always look for some rational reason. <clears throat> and in listening to uh, people like Judge Posner during the Seventh Circuit uh, uh, oral arguments and uh, a few others, um, there seems to be a concern that police officers will be in some way inhibited in doing their work by this. I know things always look different from the inside and from the outside. Can you relate to that at all? Well, there's a, there's a couple of issues that are, that are raised that, that I'd just like to comment on. And, and one of them is, um, and this is why uh, the ACLU has to fight the fights that they fight. Um, if the law makes sense or doesn't make sense, we're charged with enforcing the law. So that puts us sometimes in an untenable position. Um, you, Look at the debate about cannabis and marijuana laws. Uh, look at some of the various uh, issues around that. The the issue the and and this obviously predates it. But there's there's one thing that I can point out, and and obviously we're not talking about the same thing. And I understand that before I even finish this statement. Um, interfering, total separate issue as articulated. Interfering with the police action is a totally separate issue. But at the same time. There's something else that I just want to put on your radar screen and not make an excuse, not, not make a, a statement about it. But the issue of counter surveillance is very important in today's world. Um, going back years ago, you know, perhaps Jesse James would case a bank before they did a bank robbery and they would look at the comings and goings and, and things of that nature. In the modern terrorism world, there's a big issue as far as recording goings on at certain events. And, and, Quite frankly, many of the leads that come into the FBI and police departments across the country has to do with, you know, uh, a couple of people uh, videotaping uh, the the uh, Sears Tower or, or, or pick a target, and and that kind of raises suspicion, which kind of takes it to a different level. And it's not what this discussion is about. While I realize that it still touches on that same argument of you know. What is it that you're filming and why are you filming it? A police officer should be able to intelligently articulate why they are conducting an investigation of a number of people who are videotaping the underside of a bridge, 
for instance, which recently happened here in Chicago. Um, you, if you're not an engineering student and you're not studying architecture, you know, let's, let's talk about what it is that you're doing. So, you know, that, that's an issue that kind of touches on this circle. Can I ask your reactions to that, uh, Ms. Dell? Uh, I, I can see where police officers in some circumstances are concerned about filming things underside of a bridge. Um, I think when people are engaged in that activity, you need to make note of them if you think that they are engaging in other suspicious type activity. Certainly keep an eye on them. Um, I don't see how banning photography, and you're never going to be able to have a policeman on every corner watching everybody who takes a photograph. I, I know that that issue is frequently articulated where I am in, in uh, Washington. I actually, my office is about three blocks from the Iwo Jima Memorial in Arlington, and uh, that's relatively close to the Pentagon. And for a number of years, uh, right after 9-11, WJLA is right across the street from us. And every time they went up on a certain bridge over the George Washington Parkway and tried to get long shots of the Pentagon, the Pentagon uh, police force would come out and say, hey, you can't do that. Um, well, those of you who've been to Arlington know that you can pretty much be perched up on that hill and get a pretty good view of the Pentagon from al almost anywhere. Uh, so that one always puzzled me. Uh, I, I think it's a compelling argument, but I don't think it's compelling enough to ban general photography in public places. I basically concur with the comments. Uh, I think Superintendent McCarthy himself has suggested that it has some concerns, but it's not the same concern. Um, I don't think there's a national security threat posed or you know, anything suspicious about overt recording of police activities, particularly in public forums. Um, I think the more problematic thing that's occurred with, I think there's SARS reports that people are, are filing. Uh, so there's suspicious activity reports that are mandated under federal law for cooperating law enforcement agencies like the Chicago Police Department. And I think that there's probably a place for those. Uh, I think the, the, the place that we, we, we run into trouble um, is where people are prohibited absolutely from doing something as opposed to having somebody inquire about what they're doing. Um, the law gives a police officer the right to approach someone in an informational context to request information. You can or cannot answer depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, even in terms of identifying your name, uh, identifying yourself. But nevertheless, I, they have a right to ask the questions. You have the right to uh, determine whether or not you want to answer the question. It probably is in your interest and prudent and professional generally to answer those questions. I'm not suggesting you not do that. Uh, but it is different than a prohibition, an absolute prohibition on uh, photographing objects or places. I'm not aware of this happening in Chicago in, recent, in the recent past, but uh, the instances that really get my back up and just drive me crazy are those that when the record develops and you realize there was a crowd of people, there were a number of people there who had cameras who had uh, and were recording things, but those who were the local media or had a press pass around their neck were singled out and arrested and everybody else was let go. Uh, those are the ones that really make me crazy. I'm not aware of anything like that happening here in Chicago, but I've got a few of those. Um, the Illinois Eavesdropping Act, this particular provision that we're talking about, makes an exception for uh, news media. Uh, if I've read it correctly. Does that trouble you at all, that that, that, that distinction is made between uh, First Amendment rights of, of a certain select group and everybody else? Um, from our, first of all, it's not really a, a blanket exception. What it says is, is if, a, uh, if the media is trying to capture a permitted message and under Illinois law if you were filming uh, the president uh, speaking at a rally you would be permitted to do that because that's not a conversation you're not allowed to record conversations but the case law has interpreted the courts the federal courts interpreting the Illinois statute have said that that's not a conversation 
Uh, if you incidentally, that's the word, if you incidentally capture somebody else's conversation, uh, that you're exempt under the statute. But in terms of doing precisely what I'm asking, the ACLU is asking to be allowed to do, you would be subject to prosecution. If you were intentionally trying to capture the conversation of a police officer and a civilian on the street uh, in perhaps the very conversation that the superintendent has described, uh, a police officer asking an individual whether or not uh, they want to leave or be arrested, and the uh, uh, civilian responds to that inquiry, that's a conversation. And if you record it as a member of the media, you are violating the law and subject to the same prosecution as anybody else. Uh, so there is no real exception that's meaningful under Illinois law. Um, and, and I'd point out that the law really has never, well, first of all, who's a journalist? And we could spend the next three hours discussing that. And I'm sure those of you who are in, enrolled here have done that a number of times. Um, but the law does not distinguish, uh, make exceptions for journalists engaging in news gathering behavior versus anyone else uh, in a venue that is open to the public. Um, and the notion that some statute in a very vague way tries to determine what's news and what's not, uh, I, I think is so overly broad and vague and, and all of those things that, you know, the constitutional tests that you have to pass, that I, I just don't see how, I, I just don't see how this law can stand. Okay, questions from the audience, anyone? Yes, uh, Steve Franklin. Chief, question. If the law is still standing four months from now, we have about 3,000 foreign journalists visiting Chicago, um, what will you do? Well, I, <clears throat> I can't imagine um, predicting what's going to happen, but my first blush would be that we would have to undergo some sort of process to ensure that the folks coming here are familiarized with the behaviors that are going to be legal and illegal in the state of Illinois. So I think it would be incumbent on, on us to ensure that we fill people in on, on expected behaviors, quite frankly, and that, that's what I would be doing. Other reactions to that? My reaction is, did anybody else uh, see Reporter Sands Frontier's report today where because of all of these reporter arrests at the protests, our rating that they put out every year dropped precipitously? For this very reason, um, I, I think the foreign journalists who really have come to expect leadership from the United States and for us to set uh, a standard that many of them cannot, unfortunately, not attain, uh, for them to come here and be confronted with rules and, and laws like that is probably, uh, well, it's undoubtedly going to shock them. Uh, and uh, the rest of the world, this, quite honestly, I, I would think would be an embarrassment. Other questions? Yes, sir. Chief, welcome to Chicago. Um, as a journalist, I'm, I'm really uh, frightened by uh, certain tactics that, that, that are said when it comes to terrorism laws, uh, especially photographing around power plants and um, oil companies that, that have uh, their refineries. Um, these, these things affect the environment. And uh, as journalists, we have the uh, obligation to report uh, maybe pollution and certain things that might be spilling out of these uh, plants. Um, people are using, uh, law enforcement using the law as, well, you might be a terrorist as part of uh, an escape goat, I feel like. And, you know, to us is kind of, I feel like that's a danger to the public because we are less informed of what happens um, around us, um, you know. So I, I think we got to be careful the way we use this, this law of uh, terrorism. If you go to O'Hare Airport, you can't photograph the, the belly of an airplane, you know, even if you identify yourself and you show the uh, officer credential. 
So I'm, I'm just, I think we should just keep that in mind uh, as we talk about these uh, laws. Thank you. And whether I agree or disagree, I, I also want everybody to keep in mind something that when law enforcement gets in the business of saying we're going to enforce this law but not this law, we're setting ourselves up for a big problem. So, you know, and that's why I said I endorse people challenging things in the courts and going after it and figuring out what it is that we want to do. But that's not a decision that we should have discretion in to enforce or not to enforce a law, quite frankly. It puts us in a very bad position. And then, and then you know, protract that out a little bit and talk about, you know, a 25-year-old young man or woman who, who just graduated a police academy. I mean, the life experience issue that comes into play, it's a big deal. So keep that in mind also. Even, even if we identify ourselves? I don't know how to say it any different, but, they, you know, we get put in the middle. That's why we have Supreme Court decisions. And by the way, just think about the process that you have to go through to change a law. Right? So it's, it's not black and white on the ground. It's just really not that simple. And I need everybody to kind of take that in mind. And when we're talking about the common law right of inquiry, as has been raised, we ask questions and we, de we determine whether or not it raises our suspicions to the next level, to the next level, and, and that's how we conduct investigations. So none of this is black and white or clear. So let's keep that in mind also. Yes. I would, I would advise people to uh, do what it is that the law spells out, which is if it spells out in the state of Illinois that you can't do this or that, don't do it, because that means you're subject to arrest. Well, what does the law say? I think we've already spelled that out. Other reactions? From the Other oh, questions? Well, if, if I could react to that, I, I mean, I, I agree with, with the, the superintendent. The law is pretty clear um, about recording, and they have to follow the law. In this particular case, you folks don't have a problem with the police. You have a problem with the law. And the answer to that is political. And you need to make a compelling case to your political leadership and get the law changed. Um, or make sure that challenges are brought in the courts. I think it's illegal. But I would not, I personally would not expect the police to interpret the law when, for example, if the Seventh Circuit and the Supreme Court go the other way, then your redress is political. I personally think both of these courts are going to throw this law out. Uh, at least I hope they do. But I'm not expecting the, I would not expect the police department to fix this. Now, where I think you actually have bigger problems is in these areas of general protest activity targeting journalists and others who are trying to cover these stories, particularly photographers. Um, these are far more troubling. That is not a political, you know, I would not be looking for a political solution to that. That is just a situation where journalists have to be educated and, and citizens have to be educated to what their rights are, which are substantial. And police need to be educated as to what they can do and what they can't do uh, at these um, protest and demonstration sites. And, and I would add, if, if I could, I would add to in, in response to that. Um, there, there is a concept in uh, in constitutional litigation called pre-enforcement challenges. That means you challenge the law before you've been subject to prosecution. Uh, our arrests, our charges at all, and that's what the ACLU did here. So um, in terms of our approach to this, uh, we did not go out and knowingly violate the law and subject ourselves or our staff members uh, to prosecution. And we did not sue the Chicago Police Department, though they are 
uh, have had uh, multiple arrests under the statute for the conduct that we're, uh, we're challenging. Um, we viewed it rather as a matter of uh, the prosec in joining the prosecutor who enforces the law. Now that is, I think, just, I don't want to give too many lessons in our, in our form of government, but there is prosecutorial discretion. Um, I think that law enforcement frequently exercise some discretion in what they enforce or don't enforce, but be that as it may, there clearly is prosecutorial discretion. And, uh, and uh, State's Attorney Alvarez has indicated through three prosecutions now her intention to prosecute this conduct under this statute. And so she did not decide to throw those charges out, which prosecutors do all the time reviewing minor offenses resulting in no serious injury to anybody, no, no damage to property. Uh, and so she has made a decision to go forward with these prosecutions, and so we felt that she was an appropriate uh, defendant uh, and is defending, and she is in fact defending the, 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 uh, the enforcement of that law. Yes. Um, Don, uh, the uh, Society of Professional Journalists, the Chicago Headline Club chapter, recently met with uh, the Attorney General's office on this issue. And uh, the head of staff, person of the Attorney General's staff, I know that Steve Franklin was part of that meeting, I was part of that meeting. And she's very much, the whole staff is very much in favor of trying to do everything they can to convince the state legislature to um, change this law. And I think that you're quite right, uh, Mr. Superintendent, that uh, it's, 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 you have to enforce the law that's on the books. However, we do have a time period, as some of the panelists have pointed out, where you have two major, major um, conferences coming our way in the spring, and all eyes of, of globally will be here, and it certainly will be an enormously, could be enormously huge embarrassment for the city of Chicago. Uh, my qu uh, question to you, Mr. Superintendent, is that has there been some discussion maybe with the mayor's office with this where perhaps there can be more of an uh, uh, an acceleration to the state legislature and this piece of law and working with the Attorney General's office? I would have to go to a corporation council in our law department to find out if that is in fact the case. Um, I'm not privy to some of those discussions and right now I'm not aware of anything like that. Uh, Jack? Mr. Grossman, could the ACLU go into federal court and seek an injunction against the enforcement of this law? That's what we did. That's pending now. Yeah, that's what we did. Before which judge? Judge Conlon. The same judge who ruled against you. Well, she ruled against us in the effort to try to get a preliminary injunction to enjoin enforcement of the law. <clears throat> so that, now that's, that's up, up on appeal in the Federal Court of Appeals here in Chicago. Can you get an expedited ruling from them? Well, it's been briefed and argued. We're waiting for a ruling. And you're hoping it'll come before G8 and NATO? We would like to. We think that this law is going to be particularly problematic for, for the city of Chicago. I think that the superintendent's uh, people are going to be uh, confronted with a lot of recording. Um, you know, uh, it isn't as though, and you know, no one on the panel is suggesting this, but it, it isn't unique to engage in this behavior. People are constantly using smartphones to do this. I mean, think of the Arab Spring. We would not know what was happening in the Middle East in the absence of citizen journalists. And at the same time that, uh, that the uh, government, uh, the uh, regime in Syria is telling us they're not openly firing on their citizens, we see videotape with audio on it where we can hear the gunfire. In the absence of being able to broadcast, to record, to disseminate both the sights and the sounds of our world, we really inhibit significantly the ability to bring the truth to people. And so, uh, you know, there is a natural propensity. You're all interested in communication, so it's, you know, you have a refined sense of this, but the, the, the behavior is as common as eating. And when you wire the technology to what we're hardwired to do, you get people recording the activities of their day, and you have people, I mean, there, there are people obviously who live on webcams, but, you know, there are, it's just a natural function of, 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 of who we are and where we are today to do it. Um, can I just ask you, Mr. Grossman, uh, are you as optimistic um, as Ms. Dalglish about the outcome in the courts? 
Well, first, I'm optimistic about every case we find. <laughs> uh, I'm hopeful. I think, uh, one, uh, the oral argument in the Seventh Circuit was broadcast uh, and distributed quite broadly. It's been the subject of, uh, of commentary in both the legal and non-legal uh, uh, press. Um, and uh, Judge Posner was difficult in that argument. Uh, on the other hand, uh, two other jurors, uh, one who is a Democratic appointee and considered, quote, liberal, and another who is a Republican appointee and considered conservative, I put those in quotes, and those are not my labels, uh, both seem quite sympathetic to it. And the conservative uh, member of the court, Diane Sykes from Wisconsin, was in fact a journalist herself before she became a lawyer. Uh, and so she may have a, a very refined sense of the importance of being able to uh, record public officials doing their public duties in public places uh, in a non-clandestine manner. So. I, uh, just a point of personal privilege here, I would urge all of you, if you can, to go to the uh, Seventh Circuit w uh, website, listen to those oral arguments, uh, I'll go no farther in, in my commentary. Yes, sir. Yeah, so assuming that this law is on the books and the police are put in a position where they have to try to enforce it during these conferences where there's thousands of people with all different kinds of electronic devices, what kind of probable cause issues does that raise in terms of a search? Because you don't know whether or not somebody's merely taking a picture or recording audio. So I, in my understanding, that would be a search to determine whether or not there was. And I don't know. I don't know who that question's for. I'm not sure I understand the question. If, how could you tell if you're recording or taking a picture with a smartphone? Oh. I guess, right? Right. So you don't know. I'll leave that to the attorneys. Okay. <laughs> the mode of behavior that we've actually seen on the street is they ask the question. And so if I... The police you, officer asks, are you recording? And in, if I in say... In almost every okay. instance that we've seen, we've seen, uh, uh, I think... 11 or 12 prosecutions involving 14, 15 people now. Uh, in almost every instance, the question is, are you recording? And in fact, in the seminal case that I described to you in 1986, that's what it's asked to, are you recording? Now, are, were any of these people journalists? Uh, no, the only case involving, uh, uh, no, none of, none of the Illinois cases to date have involved the journalists. And do the police then take the device and keep it? Uh, yes, they keep it as evidence. Now, there are all sorts, I mean, you know, there are these ad hoc instances of misconduct where a, a police officer takes something from a recorder, uh, you know, uh, dis destroys the pictures in the camera or does, uh, erases the recording. I think there's actually a Loyola professor who is, has a case, uh, had circumstances of that, to that effect. Uh, but really we're not, you know, those are obviously, those, that, that's unlawful conduct, it shouldn't happen. Uh, there's no showing it's systemic. What we're concerned about is, here obviously, is the written law. Other questions? <clears throat> um, Superintendent, I wanted to ask you a question, a question you asked to answer. Um, I was curious how you might think a statute like this could impact um, community policing efforts, and of course it's a strategy that's um, dependent on trust and collaboration in the communities um, to, you know, yield, I guess, better law enforcement um, results. Um, and of course, like in Chicago, there's been, I mean, that's sort of a struggle from talking to different officers that, you know, to really build that trust and have that community input. Do you see this as something that could, you know, sort of, you know, hurt that and, you know, breed more distrust, especially in light of Chicago's, you know, Chicago PD's history, whether it was, you know, Burge or, um, you know, even, recent or in 2003, like, you know, Diane Bond, like, you know, different, there's so many different, you know, things historically. Do you see this as um, something that worsens that? <clears throat> that's, a, that's actually an excellent question. Um, you know, first of all, I'm on, I'm on record nationally talking about the history of policing and where we are as far as how we got here. Uh, and, and we could tick off incident after incident where uh, police agencies are the enforcement arm of laws that just aren't the right thing to do. Slavery was written into the constitution of this country. Um, moving forward, talking about 1963 in, in Mississippi and so on. So I am, I'm a history buff. I'm well aware of the history of how we got here. 
And I, and I think that to overcome the past, we have to first of all confront it and say, look, this is what happened, this is where we are, this is how it happened. Um, I'm a big believer in transparency. And anything that would obstruct transparency is not a good idea. Because on, on the scale, I think that even some of our worst critics and cynics would look at police actions and say, you know what, for the most part, they do a pretty good job. There's some things that we do wrong, just like everybody else. But I think my role as a leader, especially in a major police department, not just being a sergeant or a lieutenant in, in a police department, is to push for transparency. You're going to see it. When we do things wrong, and you probably have already seen it, where I get out and I say, you know what, we made a mistake here. When we do things right, I say, we did this right, and until such time as I can prove otherwise, or, or it's proven to me that we've done otherwise, I'm gonna call it as it is. To me, that's transparency and honesty, and there has to be communication with that. So I don't know how the, these laws would help us uh, in trying to improve that transparency, because the way that I speak to police across the country today is that you have to act, and, and I was kind of joking, where, where you said that pe some people live on a webcam. Uh, I was joking, saying I kind of feel like I do, um, because it seems like there's always a camera around, and I advise everybody to act like somebody's always videotaping, um, because that's the likelihood of what's happening at that time. So I'm a big believer in honesty and transparency, and anything that would help foster that, that's why I say I'm a believer in, in, in videoing incidents for the protection of the, the people who are being arrested and the, and the police, who accusations go both ways. One last question. Jack. Mr. Grossman, the follow-up on the Seventh Circuit appeal. Uh, is there merit to ask the city of Chicago's law department to file as a friend of the court to support your seeking an injunction? Thereby, that would put Mayor Rahm Emanuel's stamp on not enforcing that law? Well, that would be a, a plaintiff's dream, but I don't think that it, there's a great likelihood of that. Uh, first of all, as a technical matter, the timing is, is, past, uh, the is, is past time for the receipt of friend of the court briefs. Uh, second of all, you know, uh, the prosecutions that Anita Alvarez is going forward with, uh, and which are pending right now in the Circuit Court of Cook County, are ones where Chicago police officers did the arrests. Um, and so I'm not exactly sure that it would be realistic on our part to believe that the city is suddenly going to undermine the state's attorney's position uh, in, um, in, in bringing uh, a, a, and, and taking an, a, a different position. Uh, they're the people who brought the prosecution, brought, brought the arrestees uh, to the prosecutor, filed the charges that were subject to review by the state's attorney. Um, but. Um, I do think that uh, the city need, the, the city and uh, Ms. Alvarez, to go back to the prior question, really do need to figure out what they're going to do during G8, because there are going to be thousands of cameras on, that, on, on the street, and, and they will be, uh, whether they've got the audio on or don't have the audio on, uh, they present a significant issue, I think, for, uh, for the city. Well, if Mark, if Mayor Emanuel or the state's attorney said we will not enforce that law, would that lift the burden from the Chicago Police Department? Well, I don't exactly know what protocols this administration would use uh, to, uh, to make a policy determination of, of uh, what's a low priority and therefore is unlikely to be enforced versus something that is a high priority. Um, you know, obviously we would like the law not to be enforced. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, give them a big round of applause, please.